our Royal Navy, Her Majesty's senior service, has a glorious history and a reputation for seamanship and fighting achievements that is the envy of the world. The Navy's strength has reassured the people of this country for hundreds of years. And that strength is based upon a reputation for professional competence that is second to none. Fortunately for me, as a self-interested marine archaeologist looking for shipwrecks to investigate, the Navy's reputation <coughs> has always been richly deserved. And this is one of uh, those occasions when its shining star has dimmed a little and given rise to the project that I'm about to talk to you about. In 1901, this ship, the pre-dreadnought HMS Montague, rumbled down one of the slips into the sea at Devonport, Plymouth, the product of a European naval arms race. Now, after fitting out, it entered service at a cost of the equivalent of about £122 million in today's money. And it's over 131 metres long and 14,000 tonnes and armed with 12-inch guns such as this, the ship was certainly an impressive warship. However, within a few years, it and all similar ships were to be rendered obsolete by a new and revolutionary type of battleship, mighty dreadnoughts, and thus they were called pre-dreadnoughts. But it wasn't to be the dreadnoughts that did for the Montague. It was another newfangled naval innovation, the radio, on a night in May 1906, exercising with other warships in the Bristol Channel and tasked with establishing contact with a station in the Isles of Scilly using its experimental equipment, frequent changes in direction and the th thick fog threw off the calculations of the ship's tired navigation officer in the dead of night, instead of arriving at its planned anchorage, the ship crashed into the rocks at the southwest tip of the Isle of Lundy here. Great gashes in its side resulted in it flooding and sinking, fortunately in very shallow water without great loss of life. Now, so confused were the ship's officers when they scrambled ashore to fetch help that they attempted to persuade the island's senior lighthouse keeper they were on the mainland. <coughs> Sadly for the Navy, this confusion continued as the officers of the fleet attempted to refloat the ship. The officer in charge might have had a Victoria Cross, but he knew nothing about salvage. And as the months went by, see it getting a little lower, or that's actually low water and high water, all that was achieved was to draw in the tourist trade on board excursion steamers to see the spectacle and see all the rather dubious drawings on the postcards that were issued at the time. Now, after the valuable, uh, well, uh, final misguided attempt to salvage the ship, they simply filled it full of cork and blocked pumps. Uh, the Navy gave up, paid it off, and handed it over to professional salvers. They removed the great guns, and then the wreck was sold. And a new band of salvers arrived to salvage the ship by this terrifying uh, rope bridge and the very high cliffs of that side of London. And uh, they were off after uh, the expensive machinery, which they removed, and it was eventually left like this. Time, tide and corrosion and the enormous waves that crash into the west side of Lundy eventually broke it up. And by the late 20th century, nothing could be seen. Now that coincided with the advent of recreational scuba diving. And the shipwrecks around Lundy were seen as interesting places to go and get a souvenir or two. This is uh, uh, a badge of the Order of the Garter. Uh, that was taken off, uh, and I think is in Ilfke Museum. Now, 
The waters around Lundy are very important ecologically, and the advisory group, the marine protected area there, um, appreciating the value of the many historic wrecks, eventually asked Historic England to investigate the Montague. My employers, uh, Wessex Archaeology, were tasked with investigating the site and advising on its importance. Initial diving reconnaissance uh, in spring last year was undertaken to establish how much of the ship was left and its condition, although the condition of the kelp, as you can see, was a rather more concern for us. It was very difficult to see any wreck at all. Now, it was undertaken with the assistance of uh, local volunteer dive, uh, divers from the dive club and uh, the museum, uh, Ilfaku Museum, I should say. This uh, then gave rise to a more ambitious and, uh, from our point of view, a more innovative project later in the year that would continue that work. And that was to become known as Marine Operation Nightingale. Now, Operation Nightingale, of which you will hear later, I believe, uh, is a military initiative <coughs> developed to use archaeology as a means of aiding the recovery and skills development service personnel injured in recent conflict. i that off our website, to make sure I don't get that wrong, uh, particularly in Afghanistan. Now, Wessex involvement in the terrestrial Operation Nightingale projects inspired uh, uh, our coastal marine team, including myself, uh, but particularly my colleague and serving reservist Toby Gain, uh, to wonder whether that project's initiatives could be combined with heritage protection work on some of England's most important shipwrecks um, uh, to create both a therapeutic uh, outcome and also a heritage protection outcome. Now, after discussions with Historic England and the veterans charity Help for Heroes, uh, all three organisations committed to a pilot project using our work on this shipwreck as a test bed. Now, Historic England provided funding for a support vessel and the three principal archaeological objectives of the project, survey what was left, survey its condition, and assessing the level of risk it faced, and also advising on whether the wreck site was sufficiently important to merit designation or some <coughs> form of active management. I should uh, this slide in for no apparent purpose, but this is a bathymetry image. It's a sort of depth image of the seabed, light colours, uh, uh, red colours are deeper, green colours, uh, sorry, red colours are shallower, green colours are deeper, and just see this strange anomaly there. That's actually the shipwreck showing up on a, on a sonar survey. Help for Heroes provided and funded part of the labour force, which you can see here, along with archaeologist members. You see uh, uh, Historic England suspect here, mm -hmm. uh, myself and uh, brother Toby, uh, mixed in with the, uh, the veterans. The military veterans were receiving help and support from the charity, and they also happened to be recreational divers of two to ten years' experience. So they weren't brand new to it by any means. They were identified in accordance with the charity's usual protocols and they were supported by two members of the charity's staff, both of whom were experienced divers. Beneficiaries were six in number, and you note that small figure. I'll comment on that at the end of the talk. The largest group that could be uh, effectively supported and accommodated aboard uh, the dive boat that we were using. All, um, all were new to marine archaeology and all professed to deriving significant uh, therapeutic benefit from the weightless diving activities. Those benefits were physical, but they were also psychological. Now, the therapeutic um, element of the project would be delivered primarily from simple participation. Now, Wessex Archaeology provided a small professional team of divers. The objectives of our team um, were devised in consultation with the Help for Heroes volunteers, who are known as beneficiaries. Now, in supporting them, an archaeological training outcome 
was necessary, the pilot was to provide a legacy that could be used on other sites. However, it was also agreed that genuine archaeological results as well as training were to be required if the work was going to be satisfying. The fact that the work um, to be undertaken would influence the advice to be given to historic England and their subsequent outcomes was clearly a very, uh, a very clear motivating factor for these uh, volunteers. Now, working with the beneficiaries proved to be remarkably easy. I, um, my experience, both in archaeology uh, and in other fields, such as offshore oil and gas diving, is that military veterans make good dive team members. They make good team members anyway. They work together, they get on, they listen, they problem solve, and they turn up on time. Only the same could be said of all archaeologists. <laughs> The archaeological outcomes of the project were reasonably significant. I stress reasonably. These are beginners, after all. Better understanding was achieved of the distribution of wreck material and therefore of the processes um, that have led to the current condition of the site. A number of important wreck features um, were found, including, and you'll have to take my word for this, one of the shell hoists, Call it a shell hoist well, in other words, the bottom of it. This is part, possibly a little bit more explanatory. Just down here, shells have to be got from the safe magazine at the bottom of the ship that's out of harm's way up to the guns. That required a hoist. So found the bottom part of that. We also found uh, this arm plated casement for one of the six inch guns that was mounted on the ship's side. Military expertise was also brought to bear. Oh, sorry, no, missing out. I was supposed to say that the beneficiaries proved the depth of doing measuring, and here you can see them on the same casement. Um, very simple task, but underwater, and you'll appreciate it's a little bit harder than you might think. They did prove rather good at it. And their expertise was also useful when it came to recognizing and avoiding. I don't think you need too much expertise to recognize this. Um, the large shells and small arms ammunition that absolutely litter the site. Uh, a little bit of treading carefully is in order uh, because these things are still viable. Uh, the volunteers are particularly um, interested in doing technical things. I guess the military is a slightly technical background, and they use non-destructive testing techniques, such as ultrasonic thickness gauges, to measure things like this armor plate, crux armor plate, and all this That was very satisfying for them. In terms of therapeutic outcomes, these were measured using pre and post project questionnaires, and my, my apologies, I don't like to have any words in my presentations, um, uh, but I've uh, failed miserably here. Um, can you all read this? That's also not a good idea to use white on the dark colour. Um, these were the categories we measured them in. We didn't invent those ourselves, we used the Scott Help the Heroes categories, and we simply and measured those that gave us responses back. You notice we only got four responses. That wasn't because the others hated the project. Um, they're just not very good at forms. <laughs> you can see that there is, in terms of the status, we're running short of time, so let's go through. You can see the status has, has changed, and it's changed for the better. Now, I have to say to you, that we haven't followed that up to see what the long-term benefit is. And that's possibly a weakness in our approach that will be addressed. Also, look, we looked at beneficiary aims and, and by comparison, what they thought they gained from the project. Again, using standard Help the Heroes measures, why re reinvent the wheel. Um, and you'll see, again, there was a benefit. Um, we were not expecting um, anybody to say, or they were not, they were not expecting employability project prospects, and not expecting 
testing of physical limitations. I'm not quite sure what that means in a diving context. But they did feel as though they were tested, which was slightly surprising for us, but um, good because it was seen in a positive light. Oh, right. Now, it's uh, believed that substantial national, regional, local publicity the project attracted was a motivating factor for them, contributed to that well being. Some of the beneficiaries being interviewed for radio and television. Um, and that pleased the organizations that uh, were sponsoring the work at uh, no end, uh, particularly when it attracted positive comment from the heritage minister. Uh, it's still my class, isn't it? So um, he clearly got the value uh, project, uh, you know, in its synergy of well-being and um, heritage protection, as did, I'm pleased to say, Duncan Wilson and H.E., who said some rather nice words. Well, what can I say in conclusion? Well, the therapeutic results were undoubtedly good. Forgive the number of happy photographs. Talk. But the sample was small. And as I've said, the long-term impact was not measured. So future work may wish to resurvey the participants at a later date. Archaeological results were achieved, and these have had a positive impact on the heritage protection outcomes, which are as yet undecided. Though, as I've said, it's only fair to say that these uh, volunteers, these beneficiaries, were beginners, so we uh, don't want to overreg uh, the contribution that they have made, valued though it was. It's also fair to point out that uh, dealing with volunteers, and particularly with volunteers who may require additional support, um, is quite distracting, and in my experience, you an archaeologist, you don't get the same amount of work done, um, no matter how well organised you are, because you have to deliver lengthy briefings and equipment training. Now, in future, what we would do is simply bring somebody else along who is dedicated to providing that assistance. So keep the two bits separate whilst they happen at the same time with people working together. <coughs> Um, also, it's important to remember that, uh, I thought this was quite a good slide to illustrate this, diving is a hazardous business. Uh, you'll be relieved to know that we didn't die on that day. <laughs> but we're, we were talking about three metre waves that our boat was riding over. So, nasty stuff. And that's in April, and of course the next day is lovely. Must be Scotland. Right. It's important to remember, if you're dealing with marine projects, that the amount of logistical effort and therefore expense required to deliver a project for a relatively small number is quite substantial. So there are cost-benefit issues to think about. Mixing volunteers and professionals in a diving environment is also, from a regulatory, liability, um, and insurance point of view, complicated and potentially hazardous and requires considerable amount of expertise on the part of the organizations uh, involved in running it. You've got to be careful. You've got to be capable of being prepared to say stop. Now, before I go, my very last thing, I must pay tribute to our unofficial project partners, our <coughs> what we called our well-being technicians. <laughs> Lundy has a driving population of seals and happily several volunteered to work for us during the field work. Playfully interacting and ambushing diver fins. That is my thing and that's a pesky seal is just about to play bite my fins. There's a serious point here. Let us not forget the power of the environment that a site sits in to contribute to the therapeutic impact of a project. Now, the success of Marine Operation Nightingale in 2018 means that the project partners are motivated to take it forward, sadly, without our well-being technicians, whose 
in my ability and commitment to archaeology, has proved to be suspect. <laughs> in late summer 2019, watch this space, the same partnership will be carrying out this mix of heritage protection and well-being work on um, the SMS, um, German name, I'm not going to mangle it, a German ironclad warship lost on its maiden voyage as a result of collision off Boston in 1978. I shall leave you to muse upon the irony that the ship involved in a terrible marine disaster that resulted in great loss of military life should be the subject of a project designed to promote the well-being of military veterans. And you're welcome to follow the investigation on social media.